Um, so I'm Victoria Clark. I am one half of Brown and Clark, and it's pronounced Brown, not Brawn, so you're in the know there. And it's Clark with an E, not Clark without an E, and it's Victoria, not Vicky. So you know everything you need to know about um, our names. I'm a lecturer here at UWE. Um, I'm in the Department of Health and Social Sciences. I'm a psychologist and my area of specialism is gender and sexuality, but I also write a lot about qualitative methods and particularly about thematic analysis. So with my colleague, I um, have a picture of her here, um, Ginny Brown from the University of Auckland. We've written a lot about qualitative methods. Um, if you haven't come across it, we've written a textbook called Successful Qualitative Research. And um, we've just getting a plug while I'm here. Our latest book, um, an edited book with um, Deborah Gray, is called Collecting Qualitative Data. So this is an introduction to um, different kinds of ways of collecting qualitative data beyond the face-to-face -face interview um, for qualitative research. And it's very sort of practical and hands-on. And we've also written about thematic analysis. We wrote originally a paper in 2006. Um, Google Scholar just released a report that told us, or someone pointed out to us, that it is the most cited paper in academia published in 2006. So it's had a huge impact on the landscape of qualitative research and has meant that thematic analysis has become a very popular, it's always been popular, but it's become even more popular as a technique for doing qualitative analysis. If you're hoping today's gonna be a step-by-step -step guide to how you do it, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed because that's not the focus of my talk today. I'm very happy to do a talk with that focus. Um, I could do that, I don't know, perhaps May or June um, next year. If we did it in June, Ginny would be here so you could have both Brown and Clark. Um, but what I want to do today is to share some of how our thinking has developed over the decade or so since we wrote the original paper and talk around somatic analysis, and particularly to highlight some of the issues that we see in published work, some of the confusion, some of the misunderstandings, and to try and bring some clarification. So the focus for my talk will be these three questions. What is it? When is it useful? And what does best practice look like? And best practice will be a focus for the whole talk, but I'll do some summing up towards the end. So if you were really hoping for a step-by-step -step guide and you're horribly disappointed, feel free to <laughs> run away now. You don't have to sit through me talking about thematic analysis. So what is it? The reason why, anyone know what that is? Map of Mundi, yeah. Medi very famous medieval map. Um, I saw it recently in Hereford Cathedral with my aunt. And the reason why I put it here is because I just wanted to emphasize the fact that when we define something, when we map a terrain, that that mapping says as much about us and our perspective as it does about the terrain we're mapping. And the map of Mundi captures that really well because it's not as recognizable as a map to us as contemporary kind of ordnance survey maps. So in telling you what I think TA is in defining and mapping the terrain of TA, I'm inevitably speaking from a particular perspective. So please don't treat this as an objective account of what TA is. It's my version of what TA is that other TA proponents might not recognise. They might not recognise the terms in which we describe their approaches and they may feel even quite affronted by how we describe their approaches. So um, just hold that in mind. The other thing I want to say in trying to define, we're not trying to suppress diversity, but we're very mindful that there's lots of confusion around TA. So we're trying to hopefully clarify, demystify and contribute to a discussion that leads to better practice and more informed practice rather than saying you must do it our way and if you don't do it our way we get very annoyed. Some of our friends kind of jokingly describe us as the TA police <laughs> or um, 
one friend described us as the queens of TA. Like we don't see that as our role, as kind of telling people exactly how to do things. And what we want to do is encourage a conversation around good practice. So the origins of TA is where I want to start. Um, when Ginny and I first started writing around TA, um, we read an account by Helen Joff, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, where she claimed that the philosopher of science, Gerald Horton, invented the term thematic analysis in his work on themata in scientific thought in the 1970s. And we thought, oh, great. And we put that in a few chapters as the origins in the history. And when we started doing background work for our book, and we digged a bit deeper, we discovered, no, that is not correct. The term has been around for a lot longer. Obviously, doing historical work online is quite hard because digitisation is something that's happened only relatively recently. But we found examples of musicologists in the 1930s saying they're doing thematic analysis when they're analysing musical scores. Um, sociologists in the 40s saying they're doing thematic analysis when they're analysing mass propaganda. And psychotherapists in the 30s, the 40s and the 50s saying they're doing thematic analysis when they're analysing the results of projective tests. So as far as we can tell, the term has been around for a long time and it's been used in lots of different contexts, but it seems to be about finding patterns of meaning in things, whether that's the kind of data that's recognisable to social and health scientists, or whether it's looking at musical scores and so on. Our best guess, and I'll say this quite tentatively, is that we think thematic analysis evolved from quantitative content analysis. The term seemed to be used interchangeably fairly early on. Quantitative content um, analytic work from quite early on talked about finding themes and so on in data. So that's our best kind of guess of how the approach evolved. And it seemed to evolve in parallel with qualitative content analysis. And in many ways, qualitative content analysis and thematic analysis are two terms for the same analytic approach. I won't sort of geek out into detail about how qualitative content analysis and thematic analysis are different or similar, but if you want to ask questions about that, I'm very happy to talk more about that. So however TA developed, it certainly has a shared history with um, qualitative content analysis. People start to develop procedures for TA around the 80s, 1990s, when there's a general explosion of interest in qualitative analysis more broadly. Um, we've read some claims that TA developed from grounded theory. In fact, it probably seems to be the other way around. So just a gentle invitation to be slightly sceptical about definitive claims about how DA, TA developed as an approach. Um, at the same time as people using or developing approaches to thematic analysis, we see lots of examples um, in the 80s, in the 90s, of people talking about themes emerging in papers without any reference to a set of procedures or a method that was employed. Um, so this is why Ginny and I, when we published our paper in 2006 outlining our approach to TA, described TA as a poorly demarcated, rarely acknowledged, yet widely used qualitative analytic method. So lots of people saying themes emerge without detailing how those themes emerged. Things have shifted and there is now, we think, a general acceptance that TA is a distinct approach. There's still some debate around this. So um, let me try and think of some examples. So there's some debate about it in Carla Willig's most recent textbook, 2013, her book. She has a discussion about it. Um, other people have some debate about, is it a distinct approach? Is it a set of generic techniques? In terms of what people are doing with it, 
it seems to be a distinct approach. In terms of what we had in mind is that it's a distinct approach rather than a generic set of techniques. But it can be, the skills you develop in doing TA can be deployed in other methods, but there are some important differences between TA and other methods that mean sometimes um, people describe grounded theory as TA within a theoretical framework, but actually think grounded theory offers something quite different. And again, that's something I'm happy to talk more about. Um, in the question and answer period. So we're at a point now when TA is very popular, widely used, but there's still lots of confusion around it. And I think the biggest confusion, which explains why there's an umbrella on the screen, is that it's often understood to be one approach, when in actual fact, we think it's best thought of as an umbrella term for a wide range of approaches, and that those approaches differ both in terms of procedure and underlying philosophy. So what I'm going to try to do today is to give you a sense of the way Ginny and I have organised all the different approaches to TA we've come across. I think we got to about 30 different approaches and stopped counting. Um, and we have identified what we call three main schools of TA because there's no one approach associated with them but they're various different approaches that share characteristics in common that share an underlying philosophy and share the same broad approach to procedure and these three schools are what we call coding reliability thematic analysis codebook thematic analysis and reflexive thematic analysis and that's where we locate our approach in that final category of reflexive thematic analysis. I will talk about these um, a bit more in a moment but firstly I want to tackle that really fundamental issue of what is a theme. If we're going to define thematic analysis we have to define what a theme is. When we first wrote our paper we thought everyone knew what a theme was we were wrong. Um, everyone doesn't know what a theme is and there's different conceptualizations out there. And I want to capture the two main conceptualizations. I'm afraid I haven't got lots of useful um, things on my slides. I've got just lots of images for you. Um, so two main definitions of a theme. And we're not saying that people own these definitions, but looking at how people <coughs> seem to be conceptualising and understanding this seems to be the idea of a theme that, that underpins their work. So we've got a bucket and a storybook and I have to thank my students for coming up with these terms, they're not my kind of inventions, they're what have come up in teaching and students kind of saying oh so it's like a bucket and I'm like yes thank you I will be using that in all future publications. So, a bucket theme is a slightly playful term for what's sometimes referred to in the literature as a domain summary. So this is where a researcher identifies an area or domain of the data, often reflective of a data collection question, and then they summarise everything the participants said or the main things they said in relation to that area often at the sort of surface level of meaning and this gets reported as a theme. I will go on and explain this in a bit more detail in a moment. So that's a bucket theme or a domain summary. I'll kind of unpack that and explore that more in a moment. And then we have the storybook theme. And we were trying to think of a sort of an idea or a metaphor that captured as nicely as the bucket. Uh, the sort of second conceptualization of a theme within TA and we think a storybook works because what this captures is themes are something more interpretive, creative, that they're telling a story about the data that reflects the researcher's interpretive lens and there's a core idea, a core concept, a central message that unifies the theme and again I'll kind of explore that in a bit more detail. Okay, so let's think about buckets a bit more. 
We have agonised a bit about do we use published examples to kind of illustrate the kind of things that we're talking about because we don't want to feel like we're naming and shaming people, we don't want to feel like we're telling people off but having agonised it quite a bit we decided that concrete examples are really useful for illustrating what we're talking about. So domain summaries or bucket themes, here's an example from research on adolescent perceptions of the risk and benefits of conventional cigarettes, e-cigarettes and marijuana. This paper reports five themes and the first theme title is perceived risk and benefits from conventional cigarettes compared to marijuana. Straight away when reading this paper I got the sense of oh I think we've got a domain summary here rather than a storybook theme because we've got risks and we've got benefits. There's no sense of unified or shared meaning going on. There's no sense of the kind of story or the essence here. And then when we looked at the paper in more depth, we could see that's exactly what's going on. What the theme does is tell the reader everything the participants said or the main things they said or the trends in what they said in relation to perceived risk and benefits. So there's no concept there, there's no central idea that ties all motivations together. It's just a summary or an overview of what participants said. So the authors make um, sort of overview type statements. So they say youth either stated there was nothing good about using conventional cigarettes or stated that using cigarettes could help someone relax. So there's lots of these kind of overview statements, but there's no central kind of story there. There's no essence, there's nothing that unifies these observations. It's just a series of observations about what participants said in relation to this particular issue. Sometimes this is an issue of how themes are named. So people are actually conceptualising themes in the storybook way, but they've named them in a way that makes them sound like bucket themes. So it's about getting your themes well named. And there was a big debate on Twitter about that recently, about is it important to name your themes well? And we think it is, because they're a bit like the, hello, welcome to my theme. This is what my theme's going to be about. They're a bit like an abstract or an invitation or a welcome to the theme that gives you a sense of what it's going to be about. So we do see that as quite important and we definitely say avoid um, one word theme names unless you're doing something very poetic and kind of creative. So there is a debate about whether this is a meaningful conceptualisation of a theme or whether this represents an underdeveloped theme. When the researchers haven't done enough analytic work. They've just skimmed over the surface of the data and they haven't gone deeper to think about underlying patterns, underlying concepts, underlying ideas. So for many TA proponents, this is a valid conceptualization of a theme. For Ginny and I, and in terms of our approach, we see this as an underdeveloped theme, as something that hasn't been fully realized and fully developed. And we often get the sense when reading published work that that's what's happened, that the theme hasn't, or the themes haven't been fully developed. It's not that these are the right themes for the aims of the research, it's that the researchers could have gone deeper, could have developed their understanding and their insight if the analytic engagement had a bit more depth. So to give you another example from a study looking at Muslim views on mental health and psychotherapy. Um, it's a paper that reported seven themes. That's a fairly hefty number of themes for one relatively short paper. And these were causes, problem management, relevance of services, barriers, service delivery, therapy content, and therapy characteristics. Again, you can tell from those theme names that you're getting this kind of domain summary bucket theme everything the participants said about therapy, char therapist characteristics rather than some kind of unifying pattern or idea. Um, I actually use this paper in teaching um, 
used it last year and we were having a discussion about it and what the students kind of pointed out is when you get to the discussion section the authors make some really interesting observations about their data so one of the things that they talked about was the fact that cutting across all these different themes was an interweaving of religious and secular influences in participant sense making and we thought well that's themes that's where they are that's where the story is and if more analytic work had been done that this would have been a far more insightful interpretive interrogative analysis that would have gone beyond kind of skimming the surface and simply summarizing so it is worth holding in mind how you're conceptualizing themes and what you're trying to achieve with your themes. Sometimes my applied colleagues tell me, well, Victoria, it's different in applied research. You're an airy fairy academic and in applied research, we've got to be really concrete and this is how we should be doing our themes. So um, I was very pleased when I came across a few papers published in nursing that actually make a very similar argument that these kind of themes aren't fully worked up themes, that applied researchers need to be doing more analytic work, need to be raising their analysis from domain summaries to fully realised themes, because this is really important for achieving actionable outcomes from applied research. The fact that participants, some of them said this and some of them said that, you can't do much with, but getting to those underlying patterns, concepts, ideas, that can be really useful. That can be something that can inform actionable outcomes. Um, and I'll point you to those three papers um, later on, because I think they're a really useful read, particularly if you're working in um, applied domains. Okay. So, I've said fully realised themes, and then I realised I wanted to change it, but it's a bit late now. So, let's call them storybook themes. And here, the theme is shared, a patterning of shared meaning underpinned by a central concept or a central idea. So when we sort of reflected on the fact, all people say, don't seem to be understanding what we meant by a theme, and lots of people are doing domain summaries and saying they're you, you know, using Brown and Clark and reporting domain summaries, and that's not really what we had in mind. Um, we decided to introduce the idea of a central organising concept and there's quite a rude abbreviation of that that's very memorable <laughs> um, that helps you to think about the fact what's the essence of this theme what's the central idea here what does this theme capture what's the patterning of shared meaning here what ties all my analytic observations what's the story I'm telling so in this conceptualization of a theme, themes are seen as things that are quite abstract, that they're often about capturing implicit meaning beneath the surface. So if we think back to that mental health example, we have these quite concrete themes, but what's underpinning them is this interweaving of kind of secular and religious ideas. So it's taking that underpinning meaning up analytically and making that the basis of the themes. It's about uniting data that at first sight might seem quite disparate, drawing together data from multiple contexts that themes ideally explain large portions of the data, that they're not just summarising what participants said in relation to a particular data collection question, they're, they're kind of bigger and broader, and that they're built from smaller meaning units, so they're built from codes. And this is something that's really important that I'll come back to in a moment. That themes aren't a starting point for analysis, they're an end point. That they're where you end up rather than where you start. So to give a concrete example, um, I've got an example from um, Ginny and um, our colleague Gareth Terry's um, research looking at the meanings of male body hair. It's quite a simple example, don't be offended by that Ginny and Gareth. That's, um, what I'm trying to get at is it's storybook themes are not rocket science. They don't have to be incredibly kind of complex, but they're just they're doing something slightly differently. 
So it's a qualitative paper on the meanings of um, male body hair. A great read, a really, really good example of a good thematic analysis. And they report three themes. So if you think about a paper reporting seven themes and one reporting three themes, you get a real sense that there's a more in-depth, detailed and complex discussion of these themes. The first theme is men's hair as natural. Quite a simple idea. And what the theme captured was the way in which body hair was often described as natural for men and a dominant expression of masculine embodiment. So they are exploring and capturing and reporting on more surface meaning. So participants making statements about the naturalness of male body hair. But the theme also goes deeper and looks at some of the underlying assumptions that enable the surface meaning to make sense. So they looked at the ideas that men should be hairy and women hairless, that men's embodiment is biologically located and natural, that women's embodiment is socially located and worked upon and produced. And they looked at how these gendered assumptions were naturalised and essentialised in participant sense making. So hopefully you get a sense from that that it's something more interpretive, it's something interrogating more, it does involve reporting and making sense of more concrete meaning, but it's also thinking about the underlying assumptions as well. So that's a storybook theme, but it's also what we would consider in our approach to TA, a fully realised theme. So the other point I wanted to make about themes, my input and output machine. I had lots of fun on Google Scholar looking for on Google looking for images. Um, it's different approaches to TA vary on whether themes are conceptualised as inputs into the analytic process, so the thing you start with, or whether they're outputs, the thing you work towards, the thing you get with, that you end up with. So for some versions of TA, you start with your themes, they're your analytic inputs. You develop them right at the start, perhaps after some data familiarisation or before engaging with data at all, and that they guide the subsequent coding process. They're also the thing that you report, they organise the reporting, but you develop them right at the start, often reflective of data collection questions, for example. So, in some instances, the um, questions that people use in their interview schedule become their themes and what they report are summaries of each of those responses to each of those questions. So you can see how when themes are conceptualised as inputs they're often domain summaries because these are things that you can very easily identify at the start. When themes are seen as outputs they come after coding and they're built from codes. So with inputs, we move from theme to code to theme. And with outputs, we move from code to theme. And so when people conceptualise themes as analytic outputs, they tend to be the more storybook conceptualisation of a theme. Because it'd be quite hard to necessarily identify that at the start of the process because it involves some kind of thinking, engagement, um, interpretive work and it would be you wouldn't necessarily spot that right at the start without really engaging with the data. So those are two important distinctions bucket theme, storybook theme, input or output. So let's look at the three main kinds of TA. So we have coding reliability, reflexive or organic, we used to call it organic we're now sort of thinking oh maybe reflexive is a good word um, and codebook. And I can now answer the question that the first time we did a TA workshop, someone said, what's the difference between TA and framework analysis? And I have no idea. Now, happily, I can answer that question. Would it be helpful to talk through small Q, big Q? Is that language everyone's familiar with? Or would it be useful to talk through that? OK, I can see some nodding. So this is a distinction made by um, Kidder and Fine. And they're distinguishing between different conceptualizations of qualitative research. So small q qualitative research is the use of qualitative tools and techniques, but within a broadly positivist sensibility. So it's small or partially quality. 
in that the core components of research, technique and philosophy, are only partially qualitative. The techniques are qualitative, but the philosophy isn't. Big Q qualitative is when both those elements, the techniques and the philosophy, are qualitative. So if we think about the characteristics of qualitative, a qualitative paradigm or a paradigm, paradigms plural, there's a big debate about is qualitative research a paradigm, is it multiple paradigms, I won't get bogged down into that now. But if we think about qualitative paradigm, then some of the characteristics might be um, contextual meaning, so meaning being situated and contextual, the acknowledgement of multiple realities, um, an emphasis on researcher subjectivity as a resource, an emphasis on researcher reflexivity, and so on. So Big Q qualitative is about that kind of philosophy and using qualitative techniques in relation to situated within that kind of philosophy. And we find this distinction a really useful way for thinking about different approaches to thematic analysis and mapping out what's different between different approaches. So coding reliability approaches are small <coughs> q. So qualitative techniques, positivist philosophy. Our reflexive approach, and there are others, we're not the only one, but there are others, are about qualitative techniques and a qualitative philosophy. And then codebook approaches, we've called them biggest Q, sometimes we called them medium Q, because they're sort of a bit qualitative and a bit structured and a bit more positivist. Okay, so I talk about those in a bit more detail. So coding reliability. This is the kind of thematic analysis that is closest to qualitative content analysis. It's the kind of thematic analysis that has been around the longest and it's particularly widely used in the US where um, there's a real emphasis on positivism and there hasn't been the same tradition of qualitative research in many disciplines as there has um, in the UK and Europe and Australia and New Zealand and so on. So small q or coding reliability um, TA, as I said, partially qualitative. Qualitative data is collected, qualitative data is analysed, it's not transformed into statistics and qualitative data is reported, so extracts from interviews and so on. But the underlying logic of the approach is positivist. For some proponents, and the main one is Boyatzis, Richard Boyatzis, um, a blue book published in 1998. Um, TA bridges the divide between qualitative and quantitative approaches. So its advantage is that it enables you to engage in qualitative research, but in a way that makes sense to positivist researchers. So he talks about TA as a translator of those speaking the language of qualitative analysis and those speaking the language of quantitative analysis. So this form of TA shares lots of values in common with positivism and import the importance of reliability, the importance of replicability and so on. Those values haven't really shifted with a move to qualitative approaches. So this will make sense in a moment. Um, so the emphasis in coding reliability approaches is ensuring reliable or accurate coding. And we can see when our logic is positivist that that makes sense. So themes are conceptualised as inputs and domain summaries and are often developed from data collection questions. And coding is very structured. It's guided by a code book or a coding frame. And the coding frame is developed right at the start of the analytic process. In some instances, it's developed before there's any data collection, data analysis, and in other instances, it's developed um, after some familiarization. So it's structured and it doesn't shift, it doesn't change. You develop it, <coughs> excuse me, and then you apply it to the data. So the code book will typically contain a list of codes, um, definitions for each code, a label for each code, information on how to identify the codes, descriptions of exclusion or qualifications and examples. So it's, it's quite a big undertaking to produce your code book. And 
The ideal is that multiple researchers would apply the code book to the data set. And often, a lack of prior engagement, a lack of prior knowledge with the focus of the research is seen as the ideal qualities for one of your team of coders, that they come to the topic cold with no preconceptions and knowledge. They're trained in the use of the code book and they're all sent away on their own to independently work through the data. And then in coding reliability approaches, there's some kind of measure of coding reliability. This is where I'm going to sound like I might understand statistics, but I absolutely don't, so please don't ask me questions. Um, so coding agreement is typically calculated with Cohen's kappa, and a kappa of 0.8 or higher is seen as reliable coding. So the assumption is if the coders agree that they put the same bit of data in the same code, then that is allows you to claim that your interpretation of the data is accurate and the coding is reliable. Obviously, that is underpinned by a certain set of philosophical assumptions that are not mirrored in all forms of TA. So we are a bit puzzled when we read papers and we read papers an awful lot that claim to use our approach and then combine it with coding, with code books and coding reliability measures and we kind of wonder, well, how, did, how does that work? How do you put those things together? Okay, so I could be neutral and say, this is one way to do it and there are other ways. But for us, this doesn't allow for the things that make qualitative research awesome. It's too constrained, it's too structured. The things that make qualitative research great in our view, a depth of engagement, um, open-ended and flexible processes, being open and exploratory, emphasizing researcher subjectivity rather than seeing it as a problem to be managed, reflexivity and so on. So for us, it doesn't represent what's exciting about qualitative work. It bridges the divide by offering quite a impoverished vision of what qualitative research can be. So let's think about, so I should just mention the scores are, this is ideal coding. When everyone agrees what something is, this is when we get to ideal coding. So reflexive or organic approaches to thematic analysis represent both qualitative techniques and qualitative philosophy that it's an organic and iterative process to doing research. So coding is fluid and it's flexible. It's not fixed in any way. So codes can evolve and change throughout the coding process. You can rename them, you can split them into two or more codes. You can collapse them together with other codes that you might do several sweeps through your data set of coding that coding is a sort of fluid and it's an open process and the aim is to reflect how the researcher is conceptualizing the data and how that conceptualization is shifting and hopefully deepening and growing and developing so it's not about accuracy it's not about reliability because those are seen as things that aren't possible it's about interpretive engagement, depth of engagement, and ensuring the coding process reflects the developing understanding of the data. So it's about the researcher as storyteller, actively engaged in interpreting the data through the lens of their own cultural membership and social positionings, their theoretical assumptions and ideological commitments. So it's not about accuracy, it's not about reliability, it's about immersion and depth of engagement. So you can see why from that standpoint, coding reliability approaches don't seem to offer what's great about qualitative research because they're quite fixed, they're quite rigid, the themes are determined at the start of the process, there's no opportunity for kind of flexibility, fluidity and changing understanding. The other thing that's really important about big Q qualitative research and 
I would say big use matic analysis as well, that's often kind of underplayed, is that it often has an explicit social justice orientation. That whereas coding reliability TA would see itself as aspiring to be kind of scientific and objective and managing and controlling research subjectivity, that reflexive organic approaches have an explicit social justice agenda. That might be as simple as giving voice to a socially marginalised group, or it might be a more radical agenda of social change or social critique. We haven't emphasised that in our qualitative writing today, and I've realised through teaching that that's the sort of missing link in the chain, that that's what distinguishes big Q approaches, is that quite explicit social justice agenda. And we're leaning towards calling it reflexive because we really want to emphasise the active role of the researcher in knowledge production. That it's a fluid, evolving approach, but the researcher is at centre stage. It's the researcher that makes the research great. It's not following procedures. Following procedures is no guarantee of a good quality analysis. It's you that makes the analysis great. And I know that's... Um, when I'm teaching students qualitative methods for the first time, that's quite a terrifying thought that it's all on their shoulders. But we are, we are our primary tools, techniques and instruments. So, codebook approaches, and that's a Bletchley Park codebook. <laughs> they sit somewhere in the middle of the two approaches that I've just outlined. So they share with coding reliability approaches a more structured approach to coding. So you use the codebook, hence the name codebook. And themes tend to be conceptualised as domain summaries, tend to be developed in advance of the analysis. And then the coding process is that same process of putting the data into the themes. But there's a bit more flexibility and fluidity there. So for some codebook proponents, themes can shift and change and themes can be developed through the coding process. And also the underlying philosophy tends to be qualitative rather than positivist. So they're approaches that sort of have a bit of one and a bit of the other and sit somewhere in the middle. They tend to have been developed in applied context and are seen as having pragmatic advantages for applied researchers. Um, so the framework approach associated with the work of um, Jane Ritchie um, was an approach developed by social policy researchers who were getting pots of money to do a piece of research and come up with the results relatively quickly in order to inform a particular policy context. So they wanted to develop a way of working that was quick, that would enable teams to work together without the consensus coding approach, and that would enable them to come up with kind of responses to quite defined questions relatively quickly. So they see it as a kind of a, a, a pragmatic kind of approach that enables them to do these particular things and meet these particular goals. Okay, so I have to get a Game of Thrones reference in. <laughs> Ginny keeps taking them out. I keep putting them back in. So um, this is a quote from um, Brooks and colleagues um, who are template analysis <laughs> proponents. And it was something that stood out to us. And we thought, hmm, what do we think about this? We feel that it's crucial that researchers are not precious about their ways of working with thematic analysis. And I think we come to the conclusion that we somewhat agree with this. We have no investment in whether people use our approach or not. There's, you know, there's no cash incentive or anything like that. There's no benefit to us from it. What we care about and what we care passionately about is that qualitative research is done well, done thoughtfully, done knowingly, and that people use the right approach for their goals, aims, research question. So I often get asked to review papers using thematic analysis, and my most common response is, use template analysis, use framework analysis. It's a much better fit with what you've done than Brown and Clark. So the central message here is pick the approach that's right for you 
and enact that approach in a way that's thoughtful, reflexive and knowing and aware, rather than aspiring to do a particular approach and then do slightly odd, strange things with it, like people seem to do. Like, um, we read lots of papers where people say, following the procedures of Brown and Clark 2006, and then they outline a set of procedures and we think, have they read our paper? Where do we mention code books? They're saying they're doing code books and that we say... Co so. So that's the key message that we're trying to get across, is there's lots of different approaches to TA out there. It isn't one approach, it's an umbrella term. The approaches differ in philosophy, they differ in technique. Pick the approach that's right for you. We think our approach represents what's great about qualitative research, but that's our view, that's our opinion, and other people might think differently about it. So the main thing is you pick the approach that works for you, that works for your research question. So, when is it useful? Hopefully I've given you a bit of a sense of that already. The myth and truth thing is me being playful. Anyone that knows me well knows that I'm a social constructionist at heart. So the idea that I can smash myths kind of is somewhat ironic. So, I've already talked about the fact that TAs are assumed to be homogenous, singular, one approach, and it isn't. Another common assumption is that TA is an essentialist or realist method. And again, this is, we think, a misconception of TA. What's distinct about TA compared to other analytic approaches is that it's a method, not a methodology. So approaches like grounded theory, IPA, discourse analysis, narrative are in essence methodologies, theoretically informed frameworks for research that delimit the kinds of questions you ask, the kinds of data you collect, um, how you sample, or the theoretical underpinnings of your research. There's sort of a, a whole package. What's distinctive about TA is that it specifies theory at the paradigm level, so it tells you what paradigm you're working within, depending on the approach that you pick. So if you're um, coding reliability, you're in a positivist paradigm. If you're our approach, you're in a qualitative paradigm. But beyond that, there's no theory built in. <coughs> What's often misunderstood is that that means there's a complete absence of theory, or that TA is just essentialist or realist. What it actually means is, as a researcher, you've got to build the theory into your approach. We can't not do theory, we're always doing theory, even if we're not aware of doing theory. Theory shapes everything we do as qualitative researchers. It shapes our way of engaging with our participants, the questions we ask, how we transcribe our data. We're always making theoretical assumptions. Whether we do that knowingly or not is another question. So theory's not optional. What's different about TA is you have to choose the theory that informs the work you're doing. And I think once that's understood, then the perception of TA shifts quite a bit, that people can see that it's not atheoretical, that it's theoretically flexible, that it's not necessarily essentialist or realist. It can be but it can also be contextualist, critical realist, constructionist, post-structuralist, because you have that choice and flexibility. Um, the other thing that we've heard, we hear it less so, although we did get an email about that a couple of weeks ago, is that TA, you can't do it in a doctorate because it's not sophisticated enough. You've got to do a grounded theory, you've got to do an IPA, you've got to do a discourse analysis. Um, I think that sort of captures what I mentioned earlier, that approaches don't come with an inbuilt sort of guarantee of sophistication. If you sort of follow the procedures for grounded theory, it doesn't mean you'll do a good analysis. The guarantee of quality lies with you as the researcher about your depth of engagement, your creativity, your commitment, your interpretive skill and so on. So TA can be really unsophisticated or it can be really sophisticated, complex, nuanced and rich. It really depends on how you use it. I think 
because there's an anxiety provoking element to qualitative research, we can cling to procedures and see them as something that if we do exactly what so and so says, we come, what we do will be good. But in actual fact, the goodness, the richness, the quality, the complexity of analysis really rests with us as researchers and our interpretive skill. So, that was me watching the Avengers, by the way, Hulk smash. Um, so, another common assumption is that TA is just a descriptive approach, that you just use it to describe, that you just <laughs> use it to look at surface level meaning, um, that it's not really interpretive. And so we see lots of examples of researchers kind of mashing up different approaches so there's an example where researchers have combined TA, grounded theory, and something else that I can't remember in order to do their analysis. And they sort of say something like, you know, can you can imagine that we wouldn't have produced such a rich analysis if we'd only used one approach. And I thought, hmm, if you'd done TA really well, you would have come up with a great analysis. How they used TA as, was simply as a form of kind of data reduction or data summary or paraphrasing. So again, it can be descriptive, but it can be other things as well. It really depends on how you use it. Um, another comment that I found a bit strange is that um, when people are doing TA, if there's data that they don't agree with, they avoid it or censor it or ignore it. That's not definitely not something we advocate um, openness exploratoriness inquisitiveness and puzzling about data are all central to good um, qualitative research practice <coughs> that analysis isn't a process of agreeing or disagreeing with your data it's in a process of unpicking what's interesting about it um, again something we came across recently TA is just for interview data, just for kind of experiential research. TA can be used in lots of different ways, not necessarily with interviews. The key is, as I've mentioned, flexibility. So fixed in terms of paradigm, but flexible beyond that. As I said, it's a method, not methodology. So it can answer or be used to answer lots of different kinds of research questions. Um, we say language practice is the real exception. So questions about technical aspects of language use associated with some narrative approaches, discursive approaches. Can't do that. No tools or techniques for doing that. But beyond that, questions about experience, lived experience, questions about people's views, questions about factors that influence or underpin or contextualise particular phenomena using TA to inter interrogate dominant patterns of meaning. They're all possibilities. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of research question. Most kinds of data, um, interviews are used a lot, focus groups, but we've come across research with diaries, visual methods. TA is becoming quite popular in participatory approaches because participatory approaches give you a kind of theoretical framing and because of TA's flexibility it kind of slots quite nicely in. Also being used a lot in pluralist inquiry as well was a kind of framework within which different approaches are used. Um, also I discovered it's being used quite a bit in ethnography in the States. Um, don't know why but it seems to be quite popular there. Um, also, um, secondary sources, online forums, blogs, websites, magazines, newspaper articles, police reports. In terms of data, there's no real restrictions that we've kind of come across so far. In terms of sampling, and I can come back to this one, um, the kind of thing that vexes us at the moment is the use of saturation as a criteria for determining sample size in TA. It was originally intended as a cross-case method, so not an ideographic method. So methods like narrative and IPA often have very small sample sizes because there's a focus on the detail of individual cases, whereas TA is looking at patterns across cases. But we have found examples of people using it in case studies, and they're really nice examples. So, you know, play, 
kind of do fun things with it beyond what was originally intended or imagined. Um, in terms of pragmatic rules of thumb for sample size, it's really hard to be concrete. Um, if you've seen this book, you'll know that we do have some concrete guidance for sample size in here that's aimed at student researchers. Um, what we say is a pragmatic rule of thumb for TA is at least five or six interviews for a small project, assuming the data are rich, the sample is relatively homogenous, um, the research question is quite focused, and the output is um, a dissertation where there's no intention to publish. Beyond that, it becomes harder to be concrete. But again, I'm very happy to um, come back to that and talk about um, sample size. The other thing that we've noticed is that, just because I like using the word mashup, mashups are really common. Um, people are kind of mashing TA up with other approaches. So um, discursive thematic analysis, narrative thematic analysis, so playing around and combining methods in interesting ways. Um, Ginny and I did a review of methods used in two feminist journals and what we noticed over a 12-year period was that grounded theory became less common and TA became more common, narrative approaches became less common, discursive approaches became more common and what became increasingly common with mashups, with people combining and using different approaches together. So people are doing lots of exciting things which are really interesting. The other thing that people are doing quite a bit is using TA for um, systematic review, qualitative systematic review. I know nothing about that, please don't ask me about that because it's not my area of expertise. So, just very quickly, and this is a bit of a joke, um, if you're going to use an approach, make sure you read the paper. <laughs> um, we are genuinely often left wondering if people have actually read our paper or whether it's a citation of convenience for people. Um, the main thing I wanted to really highlight for people working at doctoral level, for people doing published research, is the importance of some degree of theoretical kind of knowingness for good quality TA. So an understanding of the philosophical basis of inquiry. So understanding the assumptions that underpin particular procedures or particular ideas and implementing them knowingly. So the reason why we're kind of troubled by the, some of the odd things people do with TA, so saying they're doing Brown and Clark and then use a code book, is that it doesn't seem to be a knowing, active choice. It seems to be a reflection of some kind of confusion about the philosophical basis of qualitative inquiry or some kind of acquiescence to the idea that positivism is best. So what we're really encouraging is doing qualitative research from a point of knowingness and viewing theory as something that's enacted, something practical, rather than the really hard stuff that you think about and sweat over and then you go out and do the practical business of research. That practical business is always theoretically informed. So just very briefly, for something more concrete, we do have a checklist in the original paper that we've reproduced quite a few times. And um, the thing that we've done recently is a checklist for editors and reviewers. Um, I've just got a, I won't talk through it, I've just got a, a reduced version here. The full version is on our TA website. It's a work in progress. We'd love to have feedback about it. We'd love to hear people's experiences so we can work it up into something kind of more polished. It's relatively rough at the moment and it's a series of questions for editors and reviewers to think about when reviewing TA papers. Um, if you're submitting TA papers and you do encounter some kind of hiccups, which lots of people do, do draw reviewers and editors' attention to these criteria. We'd really like them to form part of the conversation around quality. Um, so just very, very briefly, the papers that I mentioned about domain summaries and why they're problematic, I've listed them here. They are listed on our TA website. So if you go to our TA website, I think they're listed under other interesting papers. So do have a read of those. Um, 
couple of papers using case studies that are quite interesting. Um, since 2006, we've written a lot. Um, we often ask ourselves, how many chapters on TA can we write? <laughs> we're still going. We're supposed not to be doing them anymore because we're trying to get our book finished. And I slipped the other day and agreed to do a commentary. Um, and Ginny shouted at me. <laughs> so we have written quite a bit. Um, we try and offer something new in each chapter. And we try and share how our ideas and thinking are developed. So we don't see the kind of 2006 paper as kind of static and that our thinking isn't evolving. Our thinking is evolving all the time. We learn so much from teaching, from the questions people ask us. We, I think, are getting better at kind of explaining things and understanding what we shouldn't take for granted and what we shouldn't treat as implicit. Um, the other one that's not on here is our book, which is useful because it locates the approach within our kind of broader philosophy. Um, all the references are listed on our TA website. If you Google thematic analysis, University of Auckland, it will be one of the first hits. Um, you've got frequently asked, asked questions on there. Basic guide to TA. Um, lots of the, all the kind of our reading, lots of other interesting reading about TA. The other thing that can be quite useful, particularly if you're teaching, is the companion website for our textbook because it includes lots of data sets including a focus group that's in audio as well as transcribed form, lots of research materials and lots of things to support teaching. So let's leave it there. <laughs>